thank you all for taking time to attend this exciting session today, uh, where we'll talk about GitOps and um, cloud security, and hear about some best practices uh, from our speakers here. Um, I'm Aditya Mupawarapu. I'm the global segment leader for DevOps and AWS. Uh, let me introduce uh, William from GitLab. William. Hello, William Chia. I uh, serve the product marketing team at GitLab. And uh, we are a single application for your entire DevOps lifecycle. Be sharing a little bit more about GitLab and uh, how developers and operations and security teams use them uh, throughout the webinar today. Thank you, William. Uh, GitLab has been one of my favorites uh, go-to DevOps tools uh, when I was uh, a hands-on DevOps uh, person there back in my, back in the days. Um, next, uh, Bridge Crew team is here. Uh, Guy, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. I do. <clears throat> hi, everybody. Hi, William. Um, my name is Guy. I am a DVP of a product and also co-founder of Bridge Crew. Uh, we are now happy to be part of the Palo Alto Networks family um, and specifically part of Prisma Cloud. Um, and I also have here uh, Matt Johnson, our uh, developer advocate uh, for Bridge Crew also with us today. Um, looking forward to this conversation, guys. Thank you for joining us and uh, congratulations on the acquisition. Thank you. So let's let's dive in. Let's uh, level set the conversation here and spend a few minutes talking about what is GitOps and uh, why do we need it? We, we keep hearing some discussions like, we're just getting close to finishing our DevOps transformation initiative. Uh, what is GitOps? Why do we need it now? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I can, uh, I can jump into that, Adi. I think uh, a summary statement or an easy way to talk about why get ops or or what's the kind of impetus for it is uh, if you look at all of the lessons we've learned out of devops in the within the realm of of application development uh, the automation the collaboration uh, all of these kinds of lessons that we've learned and uh, then you want to apply them to the realm of infrastructure automation this is kind of where uh, get ops comes in and so you might say, okay, uh, why, you know, why a new term? Is this, you know, is this kind of just a, a new marketing term? Uh, do, do we need more marketing terms? Is DevOps just a marketing term? Uh, and to some degree, you know, I, I might, I might uh, agree with that. You know, I would say terminology is, is helpful for its various contexts. So it, I think it is valuable to talk about DevOps uh, in terms of automation, collaboration, um, efficiency, uh, scoping work, these kinds of conversations within the, the realm of, of application development. And then GitOps is, is really specifically about infrastructure automation. Uh, and so I think throughout our call today, we can talk about um, how these two different worlds work, how they can be similar and learn from each other and maybe how some of their differences. Um, so, so I would say that's kind of the, the top level, like what is GitOps? Um, Guy, any thoughts on that? <clears throat> Absolutely. I uh, really like uh, I really like William's uh, positioning of GitOps as this advancement of uh, how infrastructure uh, automation is uh, is eating up the world and making uh, such a uh, profound Im impact on how application development looks like. And uh, and every one of us who has some perspective about building web applications and SaaS applications can appreciate the fact that now with managed services that have kind of taken the place of um, all of our individual um, uh, executions of open source is, uh, is making, making application development much faster. And, and from, from you know, our two years of uh, developing a cloud native application specifically in the, in the security area, the ability to um, build out a development team that can rely on public cloud infrastructure such, an, such as AWS, and to be able to distribute that software very fast uh, using um, infrastructure automation has, has been key to, key to us being able to develop and to deliver lots of, uh, of great value to our customers. Great, thank you. 
Yeah, ahead, guess, Bobby, if you um, if you give me the the screen share for a moment, I'd be happy to kind of dig a level deeper into the the how to. And so, uh, you know, I kind of look at this as like uh, there's a there's a why, like there's a what. Kind of just went briefly over the guy and I chatted about what what is GitOps, but there's really the why and then the how. Uh, so from the why perspective, why uh, why do we want more automation? Why do we want um, more collaboration? And the way I really think to hone this down, and I don't know if anyone on the call, you could mention in chat if you've ever had this experience. Uh, so have you ever had the experience where you have gone in to uh, configure some piece of your infrastructure? Let's just say you're logged into the AWS console. Maybe you are provisioning um, you know, some new piece of infrastructure. Could be an S3 bucket could be an extra node on your EKS cluster. Uh, and you found yourself, you're thinking as you're there and you're about to click into the console and provision that, you think, is this exactly what we need? I'm not quite sure. It would be great to get somebody else's thoughts on this action. Has anyone else ever been on the call where you've, you've just been about to click you know, in the AWS console and you're just doing it by yourself and you thought it'd be great to have somebody else weigh in on this. Um, and the idea is, um, you know, maybe if we're all co-located, maybe if you're in a small San Francisco startup pre-COVID um, and uh, you could, uh, you know, you could just call someone over to your desk and look at that, that kind of worked. But in a world that's globally distributed, that's increasingly remote, where COVID has even said that, we now have this collaboration problem. We wanna asynchronously collaborate. Um, additionally, we wanna have some type of compliance and controls, right? When you go to provision your infrastructure, uh, we wanna make sure that it's secure. We wanna make sure that it's passing our policies. So all of this is the why to why GitOps. We wanna have deeper collaboration. We wanna have deeper uh, compliance with our, with our regulatory and internal policies. So then let's chat about the how. Okay, well then, how do I do that? How do I collaborate more rather than just clicking in the AWS console? How do I collaborate on this more? And how do I gain this? Well, uh, I have a, a slide to share here that I think will kind of help to illustrate it for the folks online. Uh, so if you all see uh, IAC, MRs, and CICD, these are what I think are the three core components of GitOps. And this is, this is really the how of how you do GitOps. Um, GitOps, kind of like anything, like if you ask 10 people to define DevOps, you'll get 10 different answers, right? If you ask, you know, a lot of tech terminology, if you ask 10 folks to define it, they'll give you 10 different answers. Um, and so there's maybe a lot of confusion or a lot of different definitions for GitOps, but I think, I think this one is, is very fundamental and one that kind of everyone agrees upon is you have these core components. So the first one is infrastructure as code. Rather than, rather than clicking on things as much as possible, you want the, the definitions, uh, your declarative infrastructure, or even if it's procedural, you want that to be stored as code within a code repository. This of course is where you know, GitLab has a, a code repository and can help you out with that component. The next component is critical to doing GitOps and that is uh, change via merge request or in some uh, GitLab calls it a merge request, some tools call it a pull request. Uh, but that uh, mechanism becomes your change agent. So what this means is, is you shouldn't be changing your infrastructure as much as possible. Obviously, we all have a lot of um, different levels of maturity and some things can be fully code and some things can't, but as much as possible for your infrastructure to find as code, uh, you wanna be making changes to that infrastructure via the merge request. And this becomes your central collaboration point. What this means is you have a diff you can code review, you have a place where you can comment and we'll show this a bit more in the demo. But if that becomes, if the merge request or the MR becomes your main change agent, that is your point of collaboration. Uh, and then finally, the, a key, key component is automation. And so this is where CICD is a core component of GitOps. Um, as much as possible, you want to not be making manual changes to your infrastructure, but you want those changes to be enacted via automation. And this is CICD. So 
your uh, CI/CD could be together. Uh, GitOps, uh, GitLab does this very, very well, where you have a GitLab CI/CD and you can uh, make a change, make a merge request, and then GitLab CI/CD will enact those changes in your infrastructure. Uh, you could also do this where you're running a CD agent within your infrastructure. Let's say if you're using specific infrastructure like Kubernetes, and GitLab also has this kind of capability as well, where you have an agent running inside. And what it does is it actually pulls in your configuration. But whatever mechanism, you know, the mode of automation is less important. Uh, what's important is that you're not making those manual changes where you have configuration drift and all these kind of challenges, but you are automating your changes. So that's kind of like at a high level, the what of uh, GitOps. That's, that's very insightful. So the key takeaways uh, for me is implementing infrastructure as code and apply the same rigor and guardrails as you do for your application code to start with. Um, treat, treat, treat every change through your version control system. Make sure you have all the bells and whistles and guardrails in place. Um, so it sounds like a CI CD pipeline for infrastructure as code. Um, could you share your uh, thoughts and experience on what a typical pipeline would look like uh, for uh, infrastructure as code? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. I would say uh, we'll show this a little bit in more detail and demo. These can be very, very simple or very, very complex. Um, I would say at the basic level where uh, with application code, you know, you have build, test, deploy. Uh, those are your three, you might have 12 stages, you might have one or two, but build, test, deploy is kind of your uh, fundamentals of what shows up in your pipeline. And so I, I kind of think of that the same way with infrastructure where uh, you would have, um, you know, you'd run something like a Terraform plan or you'd, you'd get a plan output and then you'd run tests. So you might do some kind of tests on your code do a, do a plan and get a plan output of, of what you plan to apply, run your tests on that, and then enact, enact those changes, which is kind of like your deploy step where you actually then go and, and make those changes in the infrastructure. So between three and four kind of core stages to a GitOps pipeline. Would it, uh, Matt or Guy, uh, I'll open up to y'all if you think, agree, disagree. <clears throat> I absolutely agree on the structure. I think where we see variance, and I think this goes back to your point of what's going to be manual and what's going to be automated. And, and you made a gr great shout out to the fact that sometimes there's going to be um, uh, portions of infrastructure that are just not meant for automation to manage and handle, right? If it's, um, Adi was mentioning, if it's a single uh, credit card now that gets a uh, gets revoked from the account and suddenly that shuts down everything. That's something that you might want a human to intervene on. So there's definitely types of configurations we're going to see where human interaction, especially kind of a um, executive structure to manage and um, and um, and propagate changes in in a mature pi pipeline. So 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 one area is what is manual versus automated will probably determine how complex or or um, um, or, uh, or or broken down a an infrastructure pipeline it looks like. And I think one more point, which is interesting, and I think AWS has already called this out, we're seeing the formation of these kind of, you can call these DevOps or DevSecOps teams, these platform and infrastructure teams that are becoming um, uh, an internal um, internal product and engineering team that's aiming to, um, to democratize some of the infrastructure provisioning process. So we'll, we'll, we're starting in, in, in big cloud companies um, these pockets form of individual uh, teams that are able to provision infrastructure um, in a very short and and um, and, and not very uh, not very complex uh, uh, infrastructure automation uh, pipeline, and then you'll have a more uh, more strict GitOps process for um, you know signing off on the uh, on the registries and on the modules that are effectively going to help us build infrastructure. Um, so I think these are the two main human elements that I think are interesting when you look at at how you know your org structure, dev org structure is going to uh, reflect in your DevOps pipelines. Have you guys have you guys also encountered that type of uh, kind of maturity in the market? Yes. So I, I think you bring up a really good point on 
uh, the things you may want to automate or things you may not and uh, levels of automation. And just because in some cases you might want some amount of manual check within a process doesn't mean you can't automate it at all, right? Um, so, so this is the, the power of what I was saying, like the merge request as your change agent. Um, what we see a lot of orgs do at GitLab is um, anybody opening up permissions as broadly as possible to create a merge request, but very, very tightly locking down who is able to merge that merge request. And what this allows you to do is like optimize collaboration. So for example, if all of your code for something, let's say very, very sensitive, even like a, a particular database or um, you know, some, some type of infrastructure that's, that's uh, critical to your operations, uh, a lot of times then you have to lock that down and nobody knows what's going on there. Nobody can see it. Uh, and often even expertise that you would have in your, your software development teams that could, that could help you, they're kind of locked away from that. But when, when the ability to propose a change is open to as broadly as possible, any developer or operator, anyone in the world can, can propose a change and say, here is a change I think could be made to the infrastructure. But uh, a small group of people have the ability to actually enact that change. And that might be the ability to merge it, the ability to approve it, or even if it's merged, the ability to then say that's gonna pass then to the next pipeline. So you can have a lot of different gates along the way. And some of those can just be automated if it's some, um, maybe if it's like a, a trivial set of, um, you know, you have a test, a dev environment where you wanna be able to spin up infrastructure. And as long as it's within a certain, um, you know, budget, you don't wanna go over budget, but just spin up whatever you need. Well, then a developer should just be able to merge all their own code and just enact it all automated. But maybe if it's your critical production infrastructure, uh, anybody can propose a change, but then there's a small group of people that can enact that change and that allows you to adhere to your compliance policies and to reduce your risk. That's great. Um, let's uh, switch gears a bit and talk about um, DevSecOps. Um, what is DevSecOps? You know, similar to DevOps, you know, each uh, company or individual has a different understanding of DevSecOps. Um, uh, personally, I see two two clear sections within DevSecOps. One is application security, and another and the one is uh, uh, infrastructure security. Um, so, could you shed some light on these areas and uh, highlight some of the best practices uh, while implementing DevSecOps? Absolutely, guy. I'll let you uh, I'll let you take this one first, and then I can I can share a bit of my thoughts as well. Would love to. <clears throat> uh, so I think it. Uh, so my foundational thinking as a as a product person is uh, is is who who are the personas, who are the people that are enacting DevSecOps in in big organization. And Adi was uh, was accurate to mention. There's essentially two types of motivation. One that comes uh, from the DevOps side um, or a platform infrastructure engineering, as I mentioned, which is a is a is a cloud infrastructure governance and security motivation. So how do I um, from a centralized managed position, try to enact a set of policies that will ensure that uh, posture that eventually gets uh, gets gets uh, deployed into my public cloud uh, is retained through a GitOps process, right? Um, and and that uh, that I think has been for for the beginning of this process has been the main driver, and um, we've seen this with uh, our open source and platform initiatives where we see mostly initially DevOps coming in and trying to evaluate. Um, um, a, you know how how do they advance in, in terms of a maturity model into a place where they use uh, policy um, in GitOps or in in uh, in their in their GitLab or um, in in some point in in CI um, and enact those policies. Um, I think what we're seeing in the last 12, 18 months is also an interesting trend where um, application security is starting to eat up some of that infrastructure component. So. Infrastructure as code is probably the latest uh, latest addition to that. But you know we've been packaging um, AMIs um, using infrastructure as code for the past eight or nine years or even twelve, um, and we're seeing how that trend, um, obviously, of Kubernetes, containerized environment, Docker images, is not the, the realm of only uh, of, of only those dev small few in uh, in DevOps people that are 
doing ongoing de development are going to have to edit Docker files, make sure that they have the running infrastructure they need to start performing some of their uh, standalone processes. And, and suddenly this becomes an AppSec problem. And if I'm an individual contributor, especially now in COVID when, where I can't get into a room and talk to my security team or people are like a cloud architect at, at every point and get their feedback on, on what they plan to change, um, it's, it becomes very, very important to have inline processes um, in, in, as part of a development process, you know, as far as your individual workstation and IDE um, that kind of injects and pounds you with, uh, with uh, actionable security insight before you get to a merge request or naturally into, into a development uh, or an active build. What are your thoughts here, William? Yeah, I, I would agree. The, the phrase that I think uh, we've used in the DevOps world for a while and is still apt is to shift left. Um, and honestly, in, in, in some contexts, I've even heard a lot recently about shifting right, where uh, you talk about agile processes and planning and um, how some of those, it's basically all about breaking down silos, right? Which is you know, a fundamental tenet of DevOps. And so some of the things are shifting right, like your, your agile planning and some things are shifting left. So yeah, a core component is rather than doing all of your development and then somewhere at the end, uh, you've, you know, security is the afterthought. You are you know, scanning or doing your security testing. And what we see happens a lot in this model is you know, developers are working on some feature and then that goes off into the black box of security testing and then they go off to do something else. Then the security test comes back and it says, we have this vulnerability. And at, at this point, the developers lost their complete mental model for whatever it was that they were working on. You're, you've now reconstructed something else. So you have to go back to this feature that you were working on a week ago or maybe a month ago or several months and try to remember the entire complex state that you had constructed in order to work on that feature to then go and remedy this vulnerability so that the loss of productivity is enormous. The cost of frustration and just job satisfaction is enormous. So if you can take those security insights and shift them as close as possible to the developer where they're in the context, they have their mental model and they're writing their code and then they can see, oh, here's a potential vulnerability and they, they, they can remediate very quickly versus waiting till later. So, uh, when I think of, of DevSecOps, I think of the application of security principles to the, in, to the entire uh, practice of, of DevOps. So this is everything from your security testing, which we talk about a lot, but it's um, your permissions model, that who has access to what, uh, compliance, you know, um, across, across kind of everything. So even something that you may not even think about uh, we see this a lot with GitLab because GitLab uh, will host your code, but is also your CICD and is also, let's say, your agile planning tool. Uh, I was just talking with a, a large enterprise last week, and they use a lot of GitLab. And previously, I had three different tools to do all those things. And they were sharing with me, you know, I had to secure three different tools. I had to manage three different set of, of authentication and authorization um, I basically had 3x the attack surface area versus a simplified tool chain rather than using 20 tools. If I could use like three or four, um, that simplified tool chain really comes with an increased, you know, security posture of, of being, um, you know, of mitigating more risk. So, uh, so that's a trend we're seeing a lot in, in the realm of DevSecOps where it's, it's not, just, uh, not just application testing and not just shift left but also just the securing of your entire uh, tool chain or simplifying your tool chain. That's, that's great. It's, so it's not just shift left or shift right, but apply security at every stage during your uh, application delivery pipeline. Um, it, yeah, so without uh, any delay, um, let, let's get down to a small demo. That's good. Uh, so for the sake of time, William, how about you just go ahead? That sounds great. Let me, I have another uh, set of, uh, 
I will share right here. And what we'll do is uh, if I can start off by just showing a little bit of GitLab and uh, how you can apply some of these principles, GitOps, infrastructure as code, DevSecOps. And then I'd love to hand off to Matt to show you how Bridge Crew works together with GitLab to secure infrastructure. So uh, to give the folks, this is kind of like a, a, a sample repository I have here. And what I've started out is I, I am using GitLab groups and GitLab projects to do a separation of concerns where uh, this set of projects is my application code where you know I might have microservices teams working on their services here or their applications or product teams working on their apps here. And then infrastructure teams would have infrastructure and I'll, I'll let Matt show more of what that looks like. But from an application side, let's, uh, let's say for example, I'm working on this node app and you know, this is, this is kind of like a bare bones express, you know, if you just do like an express up or um, a basic template. And the idea here is, um, Maybe this is deploying into some other type of infrastructure, let's say on Google, and we wanna migrate this over to AWS, of course. Uh, so, so what would this process look like in a GitOps world if I wanna do this migration? And then in a not GitOps world, I might be doing a lot of manual changes. This might require uh, a lot of back and forth, but I'll show you how this can be pretty streamlined within one flow. So the first thing I'd wanna do is obviously starting with an issue or a ticket, and the value here of this kind of agile planning as part of the GitOps flow is again, just kind of starting this collaboration. So in this case, I wanna say, I wanna migrate my application to an EKS cluster. And what I can do is, is within a description here, I can add additional details about why this, we may wanna do this, um, any type of capacity that's needed, any of the parameters that we either know from the business or from the development side of the house that as a, as a platform operations team, we would want to understand uh, what are the needs before we go and, and kind of go to do the work. So this is a place where folks can leave comments and collaborate. And you can see this issue has kind of been assigned to me. And then uh, this is one of the parts of GitLab that we uh, don't require, but one that I'm kind of particularly passionate about, we call it GitLab flow in a, in a traditional kind of Git model, there's a lot of different ways to do Git branching and Git flow. Uh, but a lot of times what you do is you open up your terminal, you create a branch locally and you start your work. And then after you've built a feature on that branch, then maybe you push that to your remote repository and then you create a pull, pull request or merge request. And that works just fine. And you can use that workflow within GitLab but the only problem is, is all of that time that I'm working locally, none of my colleagues can see what I'm doing. They don't know that any progress has been made. Um, they, maybe I'm on the completely the wrong track. And so maybe if somebody could even just see my very first commit, they might be able to provide me some feedback. And so this is kind of taking that lesson of agile software development and, and taking it to the next level. So if you can kind of remember in a waterfall world, you might work on something for three months or six months. You do one deploy a year and then your customers see it and then you get feedback six months later. And the problem is that's so slow. If, if you would have gotten the feedback sooner, you would have been more on target. So here with GitLab, what we do is we just create the merge request right away. And what that does is that links a related merge request and essentially creates an empty branch, right? So by starting with that empty branch, then I can clone that branch locally. I can start to work at it and I can push even my very first commit. And so by having that level of transparency and openness, this type of open DevOps, uh, this kind of level of transparency, like I said, you can get feedback sooner. You could even, um, folks just kind of know that it's being progressed on. You're not getting like 10 Slack pings. Are you working on my thing? Because they already know you're working on it. So this is this kind of, uh, this is the collaboration value and the efficiency of collaboration you get by working in a, this kind of open and transparent way. And so then uh, within this merge request, we would see maybe like what the change was made. And so in this case, we see that within this file, the GitLab CI YAML file, this is the file that defines my pipeline. And I'll show a little bit more of this file in a moment, but here I'm literally just changing from my EKS 
uh, cluster from my GKE cluster, my EKS cluster to migrate the application. And, uh, you know, I can have a uh, review here. So for example, here I've tagged a colleague to say like, hey, can you review this MR? So this is that concept of anyone I've proposed, somebody's proposed a change to define the requirements, somebody else can pick up the work and then somebody else can even have the, the permissions to even uh, enact that change. So uh, of course, what we've got here is uh, within this one merge request, this becomes a central point of collaboration. And the value of having your uh, code repository, your agile planning and your CICD, this is kind of within the one tool, what I was talking about. In addition to those security advantages, this is the collaboration advantage where I can now see the pipeline in one spot. So what I might wanna do here is look into a particular test and see uh, what, is, what has kind of gone on. So I can kind of see the log within, let's say my container scanning to review this. And if there's some kind of challenge or if there's some kind of, if, if one of these comes back wrong, I can go and fix it right away. So. This would be like my merge request and my code. I could do code review where uh, I could even leave comments in line. And this becomes a helpful collaboration point to say on this line, uh, we would change something. But from the merge request, you have kind of the pipeline in line, but we can take a look a little bit deeper at what shows up. And this is, this is a, a fuller pipeline view here. And the thing I want to point out is a, a feature that we're using here within GitLab is what we call auto DevOps. And I'll show you what this looks like. So you might say this is, we talked about uh, earlier, you know, Adi, you were asking about the stages. So here we have build, test, uh, what we would call review, um, DAST and performance. And so this is a few more than just build, test, deploy. Uh, but the idea is out of this basic, if I just want to get this basic app dev pipeline, uh, what does that configuration look like? And so one of the nice features that I want to point out is if we go into our main repository and we look at this pipeline definition, we can see that this file is very, very small. It just has a few lines. And what I'm, so what I'm doing here is I'm importing the auto DevOps template. And uh, this is valuable from several ways. So one, you should take advantage of this feature because you just get a pipeline out of the box and hey, look at this kind of pretty sophisticated, not sophisticated, but robust. Look at this beautiful, nice best practices pipeline that you just get just by importing one line. But the other component here that we see is uh, as a best practice, a lot of businesses will segment aspects of capabilities. And so for example, if I even look at this template, this is not just one template, but that one actually implements several others. So there's a test template and a build template. And we really recommend this kind of like uh, separation of concerns where you can have bits of functionality, let's say it's a deploy script or deploy to a particular part or a certain type of test. And you can build that once and then multiple teams can import it or you can import that into multiple pipelines. So the best practice is templatization and importing. And uh, this is kind of like a help you get started. So uh, within the pipeline here, the other thing I'll point out is some of these things that are often, again, separate products, uh, by having them together, you kind of get this efficiency benefit. So here, uh, things like container scanning, uh, license scanning, um, secrets detection, did you accidentally put any secrets in your code, which you really don't want. Um, and your static application security testing. These are just features of GitLab. So this kind of comes out of the box in you know, the top tier of GitLab. You get, you get these security capabilities, again, to get that scanning early. And then what's nice is not only do you get it in the pipeline where you could go and look at the log if you wanted to, but an efficiency benefit is it's going to show up right here in the merge request. This becomes the developer's home base, sort to say. And uh, what Matt will show you as well is how this um, can work on the operation side of the house. So on the AppSec side of the house, you can see that uh, the security scanning shows up right in the MR and uh, I can just expand this report. And so I can see, okay, SAS, hey, I've got no vulnerabilities there. Um, dependency scanning looks good. 
But my dynamic scanning, uh, what's happening here with the dynamic scanning? Well, essentially what we're doing is we build our container, we run our static tests on it, and then I actually deploy it into a review environment. Review is what we call, I call it a, a staging environment for every branch, right? So sometimes this might be a deploy into staging, but then the problem there is you have contention, match changes and my changes and Audi changes and guys changes are all in one staging environment. We have contention. So by having a separate review environment for every branch, I can review my, just my changes in isolation and then I can dynamically test them. And so here I can see, hey, I have some vulnerabilities in my, my running environment in this um, staging environment. And let's say, uh, you know, some of these I might wanna try to remediate. So for example, I can click on it and get some, some real-time information about what this bug is, what the possible causes are. Um, I can link to the CVE. I can uh, even have like a proposed solution. And then I can make some decisions. So this might be the developer, or this could be even your security reviewer coming in to say, I'm just going to dismiss this vulnerability. It's one that we know about and uh, one that we've just accepted that we don't want to fix for whatever reason. Or I could then go and create a new issue where all of that information will just be added in automatically to say, OK, I'm not going to remediate, in this, remediate it in this piece of code but we do want to take care of it later on. So then the cycle starts again. Now I have an issue, I can uh, collaborate. Um, and maybe one of the links there is a uh, 404, but um, all I have to say is this, is this is the kind of flow where we can see within the merge request, I get, I get feedback, um, I can enact on that feedback, I can have collaboration, and then I can merge the uh, security. So. That is just kind of a, a brief overview of the um, you know, AppSec side of the house. What I'd love to do is pass it over to Matt to show you what something similar would look like within uh, infrastructure as code. Yeah, thanks, William. Um, that could not segue better if we'd rehearsed, right? <laughs> um, right. Can everyone see my screen OK? Yep. Wonderful. So yeah, just just kind of quickly kind of recapping and going back to this, there was something you touched on William earlier about like, the more items you have, um, you know, in terms of products in like this, you know, code to deployment uh, pipeline, the more items you have to secure. And, you know, I think I think it was something I wanted to mention there as well. I think it's also important that we have the same policies. Um, you know, regardless of what those pieces are, um, part of securing them for me with DevSecOps is to make sure that I don't have one set of policies, you know, that I'm checking against when I'm writing the code in the first place. I don't have a second set of policies when it's then going through the CICD build process. I don't have a third when it's, you know, in AWS. And uh, kind of the way I like to think about this, and, you know, it ties into the whole original mantra of, um, you know, defense in depth is, you know, while things are in the IDE, be this application code or be this, um, you know, infrastructure code that we're going to show, while it's in the IDE, there's never, there's never an easier time to fix an issue. It's not been saved into a file. It's not been committed into Git. It's not cost any CPU time running any tests at all. So that's the perfect time to fix something. But obviously, you know, sitting on a developer's machine as an unsaved file, we don't have the context that we might have when that's part of a wider um, merge request. We don't have the context of that talking to the final infrastructure um, through you know, CI, CD. It's, you know, we don't have the same context we'll have when it's in runtime. So one thing we try to do with Bridge Crew is to make sure we can apply the same set of policies all the way through that life cycle. So, I'm going to jump in exactly um, where William kind of left off with the, the infrastructure side of that repo. And so you can see what I have here um, is a simplified version of that kind of infrastructure subproject. And what we're going to look at is a simple CI pipeline that takes uh, infrastructure as code, Terraform in this example, and deploys it through to AWS. 
So what I've actually used here is some of the sample EC2 resources from the GitLab um, from the GitLab five minute production app uh, pipeline, which I'm sure William will put a, a link to that repo. I seem to have closed the tab down uh, in the chat. But uh, the five minute production app is a really good example of kind of that auto DevOps pipeline pre-configured to basically take your application code and deploy the infrastructure and kind of build that CI CD pipeline to get you deployed and, and up and running really quickly. So you can see we've already created the repo and we're just gonna quickly go through this for a bit of context. So what we have, um, and you know, even if you're not familiar with Terraform as a infrastructure as code language, it should be fairly um, a fairly small piece of uh, infrastructure as code. So what we have is we're defining a key pair so we can access our EC2 VM. We're defining a Ubuntu AMI image. And then this is the only bit that really matters. We're defining a web app where we're basically saying, yep, yeah, create us a, um, an EC2 instance and assign an elastic IP to it. Um, and this instance is attached to a VPC that we're then creating here as well with some access rules for SSH and you know HTTP access to our web app and all that good stuff. And so what happens is like any other code, in infrastructure's code in CICD, we're going to commit that and we're going to kick off our CICD pipeline. Now, I've already run this CICD pipeline a couple of times just because we don't have time on this demo to run it multiple times together. So you'll see here when I ran it, um, our pipeline has a few items. It passed something called init, it passed something called validate, and then it failed on validate security. And so if I click into this, you can see what we have here is a list of you know, issues being spat out. And then we have this lovely link to our Bridge Crew Cloud integration, which will actually then immediately show us without having to scroll through all that kind of CI CD output, exactly what the issues were we found with the infrastructure of code we've just scanned, which is why we've alerted on it. And I set that to continue the pipeline as part of the configuration, but you could easily have blocked that as a hard fail as well. So what we're seeing here, and we can consolidate all the issues from that pipeline run into one place so that we can see, okay, so the metadata service version one shouldn't be enabled. Um, we should be storing our launch configuration it's securely encrypted. And you know, maybe more concerningly, we shouldn't be allowing uh, SSH access to the whole of the IPv4 internet. So that is you know, enough for us to go, right, well, there's clearly an issue there and we're clearly going to want to you know, not allow that to through to production. So as you can see at that point, you know, we didn't progress any further. We didn't do our uh, deploy stage um, that, that actually put that Terraform live. So let's go and have a quick look at that pipeline and, and what we're actually doing there. Again, a very simple pipeline. Um, and, you know, this, this repo is public if you want to go and have a look, but it's, it's very, very similar to the, the Terraform stages of the, the five minute production app, uh, GitHub sample, uh, Git, GitLab sample, my apologies. So what we have is an init stage here, and you can imagine that's just using the GitLab helpers to do a, uh, Terraform init, uh, making sure that our Terraform kind of passes, making sure that we have a Terraform state directory. Then very, very similar to making sure that we're linting or we're kind of syntactically checking JSON or application code, we're going to run Terraform validate. And there's no point not running Terraform validate as we'll, we'll get, because if at this point I cannot validate my Terraform, nothing else is going to work. And then before we would then do the normal kind of Terraform trifecta, you know, init, validate, uh, plan, deploy. Um, what we're going to do is insert some bridge crew steps. And you'll see that these are using a bridge crew image. Um, and it's very modular the way you can create a GitLab CI pipeline. So just because these ones were using, um, you know, the Terraform helper images from GitLab doesn't mean that our job cannot use our bridge crew scanning image. And what this is basically going to do is run our scanning agent to check for any infrastructure as code configuration issues. Um, but also then integrate with our bridge crew dashboard so that we can see that URL at the end to that really clean view. Um, so we can kind of see in one place um, all historical runs from our CI CD pipeline. 
And if we go kind of one back um, in code reviews, you can actually see all the previous runs. So you could go back, you can see which one passed and failed from a security perspective um, and have that historical information of security. So when we ran that pipeline, as we saw, it failed on a couple of things. And the things it failed on were, as we saw from looking into the, uh, clicking through that link from the, the output, we failed on um, a couple of issues with the EC2 uh, instance and an issue with uh, securing SSH access. So I went ahead and I made those changes. So you can see here, um, I made a change where I, I made a change where I um, put in, instead of just open to the world, I went, yep, I don't want SSH open to the world. And I put in like my local subnet or, or some secure subnet, but I made a mistake there. Um, I, I tried to put an IP address and I gave it a subnet mask and quite rightly so, completely not security related, but to the point of needing things like validation, um, we didn't progress through the pipeline. Uh, pipeline validate failed and said, that's not a valid CIDR, that's, that's not going to process correctly. So the next commit I made, I quickly went and made that change there. And as you can see in the Git diff we just looked at, um, I corrected that. So not only are we checking for security issues, we're checking that this is kind of valid Terraform in the first place. And so we've gone through and we've made that commit. And now that we've made that commit, you can actually see that all of the bridge crew integration parts of the pipeline have passed. And that's allowed us to progress all the way to deploy so that you can actually see we now have that instance created. As of a few minutes ago, I kicked it off um, just before the demo. So it was available. And you can see that that has a public Elastic IP um, you know, via the, via the VPC we've created. So all well and good. We've prevented ourselves from um, we've prevented ourselves from pushing to production and making real infrastructure that has some security issues in it, and we can kind of see all that nicely here. Now, going back to my idea of okay, that's the kind of you know the bit where we're actually taking commits and making sure they don't get into production. You know, it's important to also kind of bookend that with. What if someone makes a change in runtime that isn't an infrastructure as code? Or what if um, there's already infrastructure running before we adopted infrastructure as code? And also, is there anything we can do to make it simpler for developers to not commit those changes in the first place? And kind of the rest of the features of the kind of bridge crew integrations here I want to show you are related to that. So first of all, I'm going to very, very quickly introduce a training resource we have called TerraGoat. Now, TerraGoat is purposely vulnerable Terraform. So if you want uh, Terraform that is guaranteed to be full of security holes, look no further than TerraGoat. So what we're going to do locally is we are going to take um, a piece of TerraGoat and try and bring that into our uh, try and bring that into our infrastructure as code repo as a new contribution. So the way I'd usually do that is I'd go git checkout dash branch, uh, new contrib, there we go. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to just bring a piece of Terraform, which we know is going to be riddled with issues. So let's say we need some more EC2 instances. Let's just bring a piece of known vulnerable um, Terraform into our repo. I'm going to git add this. And we're going to push this as a new branch to our GitLab. Okay, at this point, GitLab very helpfully gives us a, yep, if you want to create a merge request, click here, and we'll go ahead and do that. So I leave these as the defaults. And what we're basically doing here is simulating someone either externally, if it's a public project or someone within your organization and developers um, going ahead and making a contribution to this infrastructure as code for you know, increasing capacity or new features and things like that. And what we're gonna see is not only is it going to run the merge request version of validate sec, 
So that's going to highlight any issues um, we may have. But in a couple of uh, in a couple of seconds, what's going to happen? And given the amount of time, I'm just going to show you another merge request I just did earlier. But what's going to happen is the bridge crew integration is actually going to annotate all the issues, um, not with the repo in general, but just with the specific new pieces of infrastructure as code that have been added in that merge request. So even if someone's looking at this as a reviewer who's maybe not a security expert, we're providing a virtual security assistant here to basically go, hey, you really don't want to merge this merge request. Um, because it contains these new infrastructure as code security issues. And for each one, we provide severity. We provide a link to some context so that kind of anyone can kind of understand the what and why as to why we're flagging these up as an issue. Um, and again, all of these will also get, um, you know, merged back into the incidents page. So how do I enable that kind of scanning? It's very, very simple. We can sign up for Bridge Crew. And you can do that through GitLab. So you can use your GitLab auth to uh, create a Bridge Crew account. And then in integrations, if we go to gitlab.com, you can see I've just added my GitLab account here. And in here, I can then select the repos I want to scan or just select all. And by default, you will get that automated uh, merge request annotation uh, on any of the repos we, de we detect any um, infrastructure as code in. So Kubernetes, Helm charts, Terraform, CloudFormation, you name it, um, we'll get that kind of automated set of commentary there. And then talking of integrations, just to wrap up, um, the last thing we wanna show as well is, like I said, it's important to bookend both development and, um, and runtime. Um, by integrating read-only, and what happens here is we create a tiny little bit of CloudFormation into your AWS account, which basically gives us the minimal set of read access into that account, so we can actually query running resources. And then we use the, that access to basically check the same policies against objects that are already running in AWS. So objects that may predate infrastructure as code, you are going to be able to find issues um, so let's say someone makes a change, we're going to be able to detect that drift, or if there's issues predating, we're also going to be able to find that as well. And so to show that, for example, if we go into incidents and we look at uh, the filters we have available, let's, instead of filtering on a particular Git repo or a particular CI CD run, which we can do, um, we can just focus on that AWS account. And what we'll see here, uh, for example, is we already have an issue uh, predating, which allows SSH running in production, or we have items in, um, in this account. I'm just in a demo account here. We have a lot of items that aren't tagged with like an owner, say, or, you know, a contact, which isn't ideal. We have an S3 bucket here um, with versioning not enabled. So, you know, we're going to see any issues that either predate or have been adrift uh, that are real and live in that AWS account right now. And, you know, to William's app side, I think that kind of gives a, you know, a full end to end of whether it's application code or infrastructure as code. The process is the same. The tool set is the same in terms of you build a pipeline to automate and to provide your developers with at a glance information about the health of a change or the health of a merge request. Um, and, you know, Bridge Crew will allow you to kind of fulfill that infrastructure as code scanning piece in that pipeline. Guy or William, do you have any, uh, any additions there? Anything I've missed? Nothing from my end. Great job, Matt. Loved it. William as well. Uh, love to see the additions to the GitLab demo every time. Yeah, just that uh, I've really enjoyed this time. I, uh, I even every time, of course, Matt and I did work a lot prior to this, uh, you know, webcast today. We collaborated. And every time he showed me something, my mind was just blown, and I was so excited. I was like, I can't believe you can do that. This is just the coolest thing. And even today, uh, I'm even just still very excited about uh, some of the ways we've just progressed uh, and just the tooling that we have that that is uh, making us more and more secure. So the um, the stakes are so high, right? It's, it's just the um, the stakes are so high, and the challenge is so complex. 
And so it's just very exciting to me. Um, I really like the, the concept you showed there of the earlier hour in the process, um, you know, we can catch things sooner, but we don't have all the context. So we want to apply this at every single stage along the way. So I just really enjoyed the time here. And, and, and Adi, I think you could uh, close us down if we don't have anything else. Yeah, um, few, few important things that stood out to me uh, during this demo is um, the concept of inner sourcing. You know, large enterprises, they, they tend to have silos of uh, not only people, but also repos. Uh, I, I personally experienced that in my past. So it's, it's very important to have tools like GitLab where they allow for inner sourcing and uh, encourage that internal collaboration within your org. Um, two is um, collaboration, right? Uh, um, I heard traces of something I call a shared self-service platform. Um, this is where various team's capabilities are offered as a service. In this case, we saw uh, version control, we saw security, we saw compliance, we saw quality, all within one, one pipeline. Um, and each team is collaborating uh, their own uh, capabilities into that pipeline. And it all happens in, in the context without having to switch around tools, you know, uh, with easy links to uh, other places. Uh, so I think it's very powerful. Um, anyways, thank you all for taking time to attend this session today. Uh, it, it was a pleasure talking to our speakers as well. Thank you, guys. Um, and we'll, we'll follow up with uh, any questions you had. Uh, we'll, we'll try to reply on an email, follow-up email.